Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 UDL IRN International Summit, 10 Years of UDL Community. My name is Richard Powers, and today I'll be giving you an asynchronous presentation. The title of my presentation is UDL and Student Teachers in Germany, a Success Story. The goals that we have in our presentation today is I will be introducing the Professional School of Education Stuttgart Ludwigsburg, where I work, go over a short overview of the German school system and teacher training, talk about UDL in Germany, why UDL is important for pre-service teachers in Germany, where UDL comes from in our curriculum, where we put it in the class, uh, in the curriculum, talk about the UDL course a little bit to give you some ideas, and then maybe we can have time for some demo examples that I'll show We'll talk about a little bit of work that we've done with course evaluation. Okay, first of all, what is the Professional School of Education Stuttgart Ludwigsburg? Who are we? Where are we? We're in Stuttgart, Germany. And the Professional School of Stuttgart uh, of Education Stuttgart Ludwigsburg, it's an overarching uh, organization, especially for teachers in training, pre-service teachers, and it involves five universities in the Southern German area. One of these is the PH Pädagogische Hochschule Ludwigsburg, the University of Education. There's the University of Stuttgart. There's the Staatliche Akademie der Bildenden Kunst in Stuttgart, the Art Academy. And we have the University of Hohenheim that does the vocational teacher training. And there's the Staatliche Hochschule for Musik und Darstellende Kunst in Stuttgart, the Music Hochschule. So these five universities, teacher training organizations, have about 4,000 pre-service teachers. They're all studying and working on their master of education after they finished their bachelor's. And they have different demands that they're coming from or different uh, backgrounds from their bachelor's, whether they studied in, in English or they studied German or they studied history, science, chemistry, music. Those are the subjects that then they later will teach in the schools. So of course they have different assessments at their bachelors. And what we've learned, the benefit of teaching at the PSE is if we use a blended learning online live modality, students from all five colleges can take courses together. And that's what makes this universal design for learning course so exciting because you have teachers from all different types of teaching schools and that will later teach different types of pupils in their schools, and they get to take the course together. A little bit about the German school system and pre-service teacher training. If you can see on the chart at the bottom, kindergarten, nursery school, uh, daycare centers that, that have learning activities are on that first level. Children then go to primary school in the first four years. So they're about ages six to nine in here, and they're all in the same school type. Now, at about at the fifth grade, or age 10, they go off on different learning paths. Some pupils will go to the Hauptschule and then their formal education will end uh, at the 10th grade and then they go on to a trade or learning a craft or some kind of future employment in that direction. A Realschule, secondary school, the same type of, of deal. They go through the 10th class and then move on to higher levels of learning for Oberschule in there. Gesamtschules are relatively new in Germany. The idea that the are combined these years from fifth through the 12th uh, year, uh, this 13th year has recently also been gone away in Germany, and the gymnasium, which is a funny word for an English audience because they think it's a gym, like a gymnasium, a sports center, but it's the gymnasium, it's the very formal academic uh, Hochschule high school that sends them towards a uh, university path coming in there. Now, what's interesting about all these different levels of different types of schools in the German system is that if you're a teacher uh, in training, you want to become a teacher at one of these schools, you have to go to a different college that has that ability to become a teacher at that level. So, for example, if you want to become a gymnasium lehrer, a gymnasium teacher, you have to go to Stuttgart University. That's not the only place, but in southern Germany, Stuttgart University of all the colleges at the PSC is the only one that offers that degree path. PH Ludwigsburg, the Pädagogische Hochschule in Ludwigsburg has several paths. 
Realschule, Hauptschule, Grundschule, Sonderpädagog, uh, perhaps that loosely translated special needs types of teachers. If they're going in that field, they can study there and also kindergarten. Hohenheim Uni is where the teachers who later want to teach at these Beruf Schule and Fach Oberschule, they want to teach at vocational schools and colleges, business, uh, high schools, those types of areas, then they, they attend Hohenheim University. So we have those different types of universities for teacher training paths and that type of system in Germany. Now, why that's important for universal design for learning in Germany is all of those different schools and venues have very tight structures about what material would be covered and what a typical student is like in that environment. Universal design for learning provides so many options of different ways to do it that it's an exciting field for Germany, but it's also a, an area of cautious trepidation. The system has been in place so long in the structures that it's often difficult to bring in new theories or new approaches, especially if they feel that they belong in the realms of sociology or psychology, and not really uh, with education. So I would say Germany is in a uh, stage of awareness and acceptance. As more and more professors begin to learn about UDL, begin to bring options into their classes, talk about it, attend conferences, spread the word about these things, the awareness will continue to uh, expand. The framework has been translated. You can get a translated version on the CAST website. And a number of my students translate parts of the activities and put that in as part of their projects too. So very important if you're outreaching in international countries that the documents aren't available in, as we know, representation, language, and symbol, right, Kailan? That they're available in a couple of different languages. And certainly that helps to get the message across for teachers. Another thing that we've been able to do with our class, and I'm sure all across Germany, is that as students take courses in these areas, they're able to put together projects and do things. Uh, the examples that you see here, just briefly, uh, some students put together quick animation videos about the principles geared for teachers. So they're relatively short, goes over universal design, representation, action, expression, and engagement to show what the ideas, to get the ideas flowing, that they would go back in their departments and in uh, classroom teacher rooms and then talk about them as they're moving forward. Now, why UDL is important in Germany? Uh, much more than just, you know, David Rose's 2021 essay, Cracks in the Foundation and Inclusion and the Cultural Response Teaching that now about uh, learner variability that's so important, but now cultural variability is so important. That's part of that rise to equity uh, initiative that's so exciting at CAST and, and UDL. So Germany is a big part of that too, but it's much more than just inclusion and bringing those kinds of ideas of cultural responsive teaching into the classroom. In Germany, the traditional didactics and teaching approaches are still very prevalent. And by that, I mean didactics here are taken very serious in terms of the teacher, focus on the teacher and the method that the teacher is using. There's a gradual move to pedagogy from a student perspective. And over here in Germany, pedagogy really kind of relates to uh, learning from the student's perspective. So the didactics from the teacher, students things, there's a lot of emphasis in teacher training on the teacher, the lesson plan and what the teacher is doing uh, and not so much on the other side with the student. And that's where UDL comes in really well. Students who take my class, are often surprised to find that so much time is spent with thinking about the student as opposed to what the lesson is and how you've divided your time. What are you doing in the first two minutes? What are you doing in the next four minutes? And, and so on. The other thing that's interesting about UDL in Germany is that the separate structures that you just saw for pre-service teachers, teachers are becoming more and more flexible for cooperation. So important when you wanna have ideas being exchanged for diversity, what a teacher is doing and having successes in this particular school might then be able to relate to another school and move in there. So that's exciting. As across the world with the pandemic, highlighted a need for new approaches in the classroom. So universal design for learning is an exciting new thing. Social and emotional learning is taking root here too. Project-based learning, 
formats for blended learning technology using LMSs in the schools and digital ed tech was a real revolution in Germany uh, with the pandemic. And there's still a little bit of blinking while that is being developed and moving forward. The European Accessibility Act is set to begin in 2025. And that act really kind of mandates that every product has to be accessible. Why that's important over here is because the products include EdTech and also the LMSs. Oh, for example, we have a, an LMS at Stuttgart University. It's called Ilias that we use here. It came out of really NATO headquarters. It's been years, used for years as a repository. And for many years, also because it's an open source LMS, the cost is very low. So Ilias has been one thing, and now to work on to make sure that it's accessible, that the VPATs are all brought up to date, and that it falls in line with the WCAG structures of AA, at least for 2.1 moving through. So the European Accessibility Act, what we've seen is LMSs like Moodle are a little bit closer than the one to, uh, we're using at Ilias here. So all of these things are important in schools. I think that's kind of neat because our pre-service teachers here in Baden-Württemberg and Stuttgart area, Southern Germany, their schools have opted for Moodle and Big Blue Button. Those two types of devices and ed tech tools are what they're using. So it's really important that our teachers get some background, teachers in training, get background in those before they go to the schools. What we found is once the teachers hit the schools, they don't have time to learn an LMS and figure out all these ed tech tools. So the idea is with this course, they would learn LMSs, practice in LMSs, take it from the view of a student and be that in a better position when they begin to teach on it too. Uh, I teach two other courses besides UDL for these students. The other one is project-based learning with e-twinning Erasmus Plus for interculturality. And the other one is introduction to teaching online and learning design. It used to be instructional design and we switched that over where they learn how to use Moodle and putting accessible uh, content into that, which is a big part of this course too. Another reason why UDL is so important in Germany is because of the changing demographic of pupils. You might have read in the news, large number of immigrants, refugees, non-German speakers that are filling the schools, making teachers challenges even more so. So if you're trying to use that standard way of approach, one size for all, it's not going to work. There have to be options to take in the, the audience so that it's really student-centered, so that you've got expert students that really understand what they need to learn, right? What their learning preferences are, an expert teacher who kind of understands the role in that, and then the expert curriculum. Uh, so those that that triad that's so important for UDL really to flourish in there. Hey, so another thing that's interesting is as I have students who take my courses, we do a lot of self-reflection about what school was like for them and what they felt, you know, good examples of teaching and poor examples of teaching, you know, were. So it's really interesting to hear about the pre-service teachers, you know, my students' negative experiences with traditional text homework test, what I call THT. You know, here's the textbook, here's the homework in the back of the chapter. Now at the end of the week, we're going to have a test. That kind of one learning strategy that only you know, one group of students is really good at, you know, people who are good at tests. So as they are able to talk about, it's interesting because they're at university, they're kind of good learners with this method. They're all pretty good at tests. They're not excellent at it, but it's really easy for them to be able to, to look back and think about when they were going through eighth grade, ninth grade, ten, some of their classmates and friends who weren't good at taking tests and now what happened to them. And was it really because of the student or was it because of the curriculum and the test and how that was set up? So you see all kinds of cool light bulbs going off in their minds when you start talking about this and they begin to think, oh yeah, that's right, that's right. That wasn't the best approach for all kinds of different people. Good. And another reason why UDL is so important here too is that pre-service teachers' experiences during the pandemic as university students. I think as we all know, students saw lots of different teachers and different courses during the pandemic trying to get it right. People who had been at it a long time were already doing it. So they were seeing good examples of how that all is working with lots of options in an online environment. So I firmly believe that this new generation, this particular class of students who went through the pandemic and later will be teachers, they're going to be excellent teachers because they saw it teaching from so many different perspectives and learned so many different ways that can make it work. What else about Germany that makes it interesting to work with these students in UDL from an international perspective? 
is there's a simultaneous move right now in the pandemic, past pandemic, towards diversity, equity, inclusion in the zeitgeist. You probably saw from the image I showed you before, Germany, the school system, it's not very inclusive because it's so separate, right? People are getting off and there's, you can change and move through, but there's not a lot of flexibility in there. Sonder pedagogues, the special needs students were often sent to special needs schools separate. That has now come under a whole uh, movement called inclusion, where they're bringing students that were formerly separated in different schools into the schools. So while you're having this move with UDL awareness, there's also this diversity, equity, inclusion movement too, so it can only benefit uh, the pupils. There are too many students right now disengaged from school and education. That school and education is not a fun or interesting, engaging, motivating experience at all. And UDL can really help with that. Teachers also, which is a global kind of thing, not just in Germany, have little background in neuroeducation and understanding how pupils learn. So I see with my students when they read the books and look at the framework and then see how the brain works, they just are kind of amazed that they're not getting more about how learning works and learning preferences because that's their chief role. Okay. And then as you know, another common reason to switch to UDL or at least incorporate UDL approaches is that teachers using a one approach for all in classes when they get a little bit of UDL under the belt and they suddenly realize, oh my gosh, you know, the pressure is off me really to try to cater to 30 different students in my class. I can now address students and help them learn to learn. So whereas you might say, well, what are you? I'm a teacher of history. No, you're really um, showing learners how to learn history. And when students, pre-service teachers make that jump, a lot of the pressure is off them from feeling like they have to know everything and kind of convince people too. So here are some other experts in Germany uh, on this list that have published in, in UDL and the number will just continue to increase all right, a little bit about my course. Here we are at Stuttgart University, the Professional School of Education, Stuttgart Ludwigsburg. And the UDL course comes in the Master of Education curriculum at the Professional School of Education. They finished their bachelor, right? And now they're in this module here, the Bildungswissenschaften, as part of their master's degree before they go on to their school practice when they're actually in the schools and they write a master's thesis here. So. Where they I get them is here in the Bildungswissenschaft. They're taking nine courses as part of their master's degree in teachers and teaching and education to learn more about approaches and uh, how to be successful in the classroom. The pre-service teachers come in there. There are four modules as part of those 27, nine, 27 credits, those nine courses. And you can see in what we use over here are called modules or modules. We've got four different modules in the Master of Education. There's this differential analysis of Lehr- and Learn Processen, Erziehung and Bildung, Diversität and Inclusion in Institutions, Schule, Berufsrolle and Berufsethik. Okay. Different uh, types and categories of courses that students can take. Uh, for us, see, we are here at the seventh semester. They're taking these. You can probably follow the colors pretty well. The eighth semester, there's this Wahlpflicht for Anstaltung für Erziehung und Bildung, and that's where my UDL course comes in. There are three or four courses that students can pick from and they can choose. Not all of them take the UDL course. So right now the UDL class is not required. It's part of their elective for, to fill uh, this module. The course title is Universal Design for Learning and Barrier-Free Accessible Course Content. So it has the notion that half of the course is all about UDL, casts principles and guidelines and checkpoints. And then we move into talking about what other barriers exist for course content that you might put in an LMS or for online teaching in there. 13 weeks, three credit hours. It's a synchronous online live course. So in other words, we meet on Zoom, and then they do async work in Moodle. There's a weekly 90-minute Zoom session, and that's followed by reading and learning activities in Moodle. And when I planned the course, I planned the course async part, about three hours of time to task that they'd be able to go through the work. And that includes the reading, uh, asking questions and posting in discussions coming in. As far as the breakout for the assessment, 
There are about 15 weekly discussion topics, and some of these are peer review in terms of their preparing before and after UDL lessons. Like, for example, they might have a handout, a handout that they used in a course some way or somebody's given them. And now they read the chapter on engagement or they read the chapter on action and expression or they read the chapter on representation and then they review it and they make some changes to it based on that. So that's a nice way of getting the theory and then applying it to see how that works. Then students uh, put together an accessible video. So they create an accessible video for the most part, self-regulatory -regul with captions, uh, easy to read, uh, representative types of ways of formats. Then there's a degree associated project. Since I've got students from five different universities, they have different requirements about uh, length and effort of what they have to put in and whether or not it's graded or ungraded. Some of the colleges just require them to attend the course and not uh, submit enough points for a final paper or a grade. So students that are taking it for uh, unbenötigte Studentenleistung, which means just kind of ungraded. They do the discussion topics and put the video together, but then they don't have to do this paper presentation or reflection, whereas the other students working it for their degree where they have to, then they do that. All the students have to attend two webinars about UDL, and they can be in any country, uh, anywhere. Uh, that's kind of the beauty of these webinars. There's so many out there. Over the 13-week terms, we, we research them, we look for UDL webinars, uh, and the students participate in them uh, in some ways, and then they write one-page reflections. You know, I'm a firm believer that right now, some of the best information you can get about online learning and about UDL is really through the extensive series of webinars that schools and publishers and people are putting on. It's just a really exciting time out there. That's why in this module you, or in this table, you see the point vary, 105 to 145. That's a big variance. But it really depends. See, most of the students, if they don't have that big paper, they won't have that coming in. there. Of course, objectives here, understand and apply UDL principles, develop strategies with UDL, right? You can read these faster than I can as you go through. It has a lot to do just to show that you are, that there's some are, are in there. Uh, reflecting on the learning during the course is really important. That's a principle of UDL coming through and also through the checkpoints, so kind of important. This might be more interesting if for a cursory overview of what the students actually do. Okay? They revise the course materials to better align with UDL principles after they've read about them. Um, D, in particular, create accessible word processing documents. There's a section about that in order to learn how to do that. Accessible slide decks, spreadsheets, HTML pages. Create a plan for implementing accessibility in a course resource. How would you do that? The two webinar reflections we talked about, and then the final thing that are coming in. B is the heavy lift in the course. Uh, UDL has three principles. Take those three principles and spend two weeks on each principle. And so that students are taking representation. They take a handout, look at it for representation barriers. And then the next week, they revise without some of those barriers. The next week, we take an assessment, a quiz or a test of some kind. And we look at that in terms of action and expression uh, prompts and how to make that better. And then they improve that one the second week. And then the third week of engagement, they have a choice of either taking a whole course, a syllabus, some way to have the lesson planned with a little bit of engagement. But it's always this before and after kind of approach. You know, one of the things that I noticed when I first started going to UDL uh, webinars and attending classes and workshops was they were very interesting. But... I still was kind of lost about how I would apply it. Like I needed really kind of good examples in there. And that's what students are able to share with each other in the discussion posts. You know, they might have a handout for a vocabulary sheet. And there, a lot of them are going to be English teachers. And that handout might just have vocabulary words on it. Well, it's amazing if they're teaching the fifth grade, for example, how they can switch that and put pictures with it and how it just moves it from representation to give them multiple ways of looking at that and options for students to really learn. So even something simple as that really gets them thinking about, okay, how is this, uh, how does this, you know, really work? The course materials, we use the Clusive textbook. You might know that the UDL theory and practice, you know, Meyer, Rose, and Gordon from 2014, it's recently moved to Clusive, which is super, you see it down here on the right, 
So students can create an account and they've got free access to it. Uh, and what we do is we break the chapters out over 11 weeks into weekly readings. So they take these nice chapters in there and we go through the entire book piece by piece slowly with time for reflection. I mount the vocabulary for the week, you know, and put it up there and the students are challenged to use it in their discussion posts. And then there are a number of quotations that I pull from the chapters and then they can pick one or two and write about them or they can pick their own, All right? So it's really meant on simple comprehension and then discussion of the terms as it builds. We also use the cast.org website with the UDL framework. So that's of course a big part of the class uh, with their resources and links. And then we have the cracks in the foundation, personal reflections on the past and future of the UDL guidelines. You know, David Rose's November 15th, 2021 essay with the six parts where uh, it's super interesting to see all the new movements from maybe just learner variability to culture variability and what this rise to equity initiative is going to put in there. So it's a great chance to be able to talk about cultural responsive theory and then also teaching and then also ask students what they think about their schools. How responsive was it to these culture? And where was their sense of belonging and how did they fit in on that section? So it just, you know, many of you probably experience the same too. When you start talking about this, it's just the classroom buzzes with excitement and interest and students want to talk about what courses they were engaged with before and what their teachers did to, uh, make them feel, you know, welcome and, and, and part of that whole, you know, world and culture. Okay, the other benefit of using the inclusive textbook is that the pre-service teachers experience a UDL book, right? So by UDL book, I mean, it's probably hard to see, but see on the right side, all the settings that are in there, you can change the display, right? You can make the font change, you can make it bigger, the line spacing, right? There's a up here text to speech. So you hear it, being read, there's highlighting possibilities. You can take notes as you're reading the book. It's a very practical way of showing what UDL means with options for different types of learners. Here's the inclusive dashboard, right? There's library, the resources, the manage, and then the word bank that comes in there. So if you don't know inclusive yet, I encourage you to get a create an account and explore it. Lots of fine resources in it. So many, in fact, that in other courses, when I tell students, teachers about it, I don't have time to cover it all. I love this class because, you know, lots of times you hear about UDL, you uh, write about UDL, but you don't really go to the actual book and read UDL theory and practice to find out the background, where it was coming from, the history, and then go through it and really understand what UDL is really all, all about. And I know when I read the book, it certainly changed the way I thought about UDL of how that kinds of works and you feel more familiar discussing and teaching it, uh, that's for sure. Uh, the Another thing that's improved, if you know the other book, when it was just available through the CAST website, a lot of the videos hung, right? They would spiel and then they would kind of stream and then just kind of stop. The videos are amazing, students like those, of course, they've got the text, but then these videos can kind of come, there's a nice heading. If they wanna watch the video, then they can move in. So the self-regulating videos allow for holistic learning. And then the reading tools settings, right? If you see over here, uh, you, you can pick the voice that you want read to you, the speed uh, and uh, the translation for a language. It's even par partially possible uh, for uh, languages in there too. So even if the students aren't reading everything in the chapters, what they're experiencing is what's meant by a UDL book. And you know, you can imagine where this is gonna go in 10 years with all the interesting things that are happening with artificial design and graphic design and ed tech. It's just gonna be a, a UDL book in 10 years. It's just gonna be kind of an amazing uh, row of options that you can look at too. And of course the bonus, here you go, right? Big bonus here with, if you're using inclusive, it also gives you access with UDL too. And then finding these other uh, nice tools too. So you see over here, the library, and you can adjust it to the public readings. You can change these, what's in there already. The UDL exchange that talks about resources, lessons, and collections. Uh, there's the CAST's UDL studio to create your own UDL tools in there. There's UDL book builder, right? And then there's the CAST strategic reader that's in there that has texts that are in there with all kinds of different ways that you can approach them and use them if they're there and you can add them too. So, for, for pre-service teachers, especially a lot, as I've said before, a lot of them will be teaching English later. The library, the strategic reader, super helpful 
for teachers to see all these other resources that are out there. But where do you get them? You know, without this course, I was always rushed to try to show te student teachers about the resources, but there was no way that you could do it without this 13 week kind of slower pace, each week having new topics and being able to reflect. All right, I've talked a lot about the course. What's the structure look like? Okay, here's the 13 weeks. Here are the 13 weeks kind of broken out. Uh, you see weeks two to three, four to five, six to seven. That's really the meat of the course, right? Representation, action, expression, engagement. And then throughout the rest of the semester, uh, you just revisit these principles and checkpoints again and again, which is really nice for familiarization. If you know how the book works, the principles of representation, action, expression, engagement really come there as chapters three, four, five towards the end. So as they're building through the principles in the early part of the course, we've already covered them. Then when we get to the textbook, they're, they're laid out much more fully, and then they can look at the framework with a better understanding of the background that went into putting uh, that framework together. Week eight, handle the rise in equity initiative and culturally responsive teaching so that students talk about, they read the essays and then pick one to reflect on uh, that really relates to them. And then we move into the accessibility part of the course. Uh, first, we handle web accessibility, we, we CAG, WCAG 2.1, okay, 2.2, supposed to be last June and then December and now, okay, we're still looking to see when that's going to come about, but just going over those categories of the triple A, double A, A, so that as teachers, they really know what to look for. A lot of them are going to have to buy ed tech or look at tools in their schools. And if they know about privacy statements and they know basic things like about accessibility, like what level to check for, looking for the VPAT, those types of things we cover, it really helps them when they get to their schools so they can hit the ground running with that. Okay, weeks 10 and 11, accessible PDFs, social media content. A lot of them use Instagram and Facebook. So it's kind of nice to suddenly they go, oh, I have to put captions for this or alternative text, you know, if I'm going to use this. So it's really neat to see them come alive for it. Um, accessible presentations in week 11, PowerPoint slides and videos. And then we find the final week is kind of an overview about, okay, you've got this LMS like Moodle or Ilias, Canva, Brightspace, the content in it. You know, how do you make sure that that is? And if it's coming to you in a loaded course, it's probably already accessible. Somebody smart at the college has done that. But it's your responsibility if you're adding anything to the LMS to make sure that it's accessible. And we know the big things that, that people add to our LMSs, right? Word documents or documents, uh, PDFs, PowerPoint slides, and videos. Those are the big things. So if just learning a little bit about it in a course like this already makes them much better prepared to go into their schools because it's part of their training that moves in there. A big challenge right now in Germany is trying to get the training for this to teachers in schools and teachers are super busy, right? Busy all day. And then they're supposed to take extra training on accessibility and extra training on LMSs. So right now it's, it's, it's kind of a lot, kind of see my job is to try to help teachers and training learn as much of this as possible. So when they get to their schools, they're real assets. You know, they come in and they say, okay, we've just come from college. We've learned this stuff. Let me help. Right? Okay, and then there's a summary and we have a, you know, go over the accessibility checkers in the LMS Ally. Some of you might know that from, you know, Blackboard's now Anthology. They have this nice tool. It's very helpful. The Ally Instructor reports. We show you how to use that and what it means. And then we have kind of a, a Zoom UDL farewell party. He puts on, you know, in Zoom, you have those little graduation hats and, Looks kind of cool. So I have a lot of fun with that too. All right, final projects, research paper with before and after examples. Remember I said in weeks two, three, four, five, six, and seven, we were looking at those three principles of with a before and after. Well, I allow the students to then to take those befores and afters and put them together in a paper that introduces UDL and then shows practical examples. So they put together sometimes about a 15 page paper with figures and examples. And it's a really nice portfolio type of research paper for them to then to take forward. Uh, students, after their master's, they apply for what's known over here, the refendariat. It's an 18-month uh, visit in a school where they're really teachers in there. And they have to interview for this and apply. And sometimes having documents like that could be the one step up to show what they've done. And they really kind of understand what's going on. So I really like that because it doesn't put in a huge another emphasis on the end of the course of trying to do some wild research paper, especially today with the days of 
you know, uh, <laughs> I even lean forward kind of funny, chat GPT and all of that, right? Which is an amazing tool, right? I just, you know, when I play around with it, not to distract it or detract uh, for too long about the subject, but it's just amazing what it can do. And I think we're going to find interesting, good ways that we're going to use it for planning documents, for putting things together in there too. Okay, other final projects. I think we talked about last time. I showed you this UDL uh, clips that the students had put together and they met on YouTube. And then also you might know over here in the European Union, we've got something called eTwinning. eTwinning is a school, 28 countries over here participate in it. Uh, you could have a school in France, then working with a school in Germany or a school in Spain, working with the Netherlands. And you have teachers in there. They meet online and eTwinning is the platform where they meet and they put on collaborative projects putting together. So some of my teachers in training, they do teachers in training with uh, Spain, with Portugal, uh, with Finland, uh, Turkey, and uh, Tunisia. And they do a UDL project. What is UDL like and how you can kind of put that one together, right? So uh, neat. Now what I'd like to do is take about oh, five or 10 minutes and show you the course. You know, we're gonna log into the Moodle at PH Ludwigsburg and look at this uh, UDL course and see how that uh, works. So here's the course. Here's the, you see up at the top left, um, PH Ludwigsburg stands for the Pedagogische Hochschule in Ludwigsburg. Uh, here's the Moodle site is week one and it goes through, right? There's the syllabus here for the course. Starts off with that one too. Instructions for re registering in Moodle, how they would do this one. The standard week one gets them into the textbook and moves that forward. And if you don't like scrolling, perhaps look around, look away for this section. I'll try not to, to scroll too fast. You can see the discussion for the student introductions, first thoughts about universal design for learning. Uh, there's an exercise for what learning preferences do you have that has the student think about are you visual, are you tactile? And then we talk about, okay, what's neat about that is you can change for different areas. Maybe you study math this way and you need these types of things and moving away, right? Week two, here's kind of where we get into that one, two weeks for each uh, principal representation. And then we break them down guidelines one and two. So we just kind of handle them one at a time as we move forward. We watch a video about it. There's uh, the textbook that they're working in. Uh, maybe just to show you what one of the discussion topics look like. Oh, it looks like I logged in, moved out. Let's go back to Moodle. Now, this might be interesting too to watch how we go, how we share in a consortium types of different platforms, right? I'm logging in at uh, PH Ludwigsburg. But the way I do that is with my credentials from Stuttgart University, and then it takes me into uh, the courses as I set up with that one too, All right? So now I'm in uh, winter semester. We go down there and we're gonna find winter semester. I think uh, this is course, there it is, the 4347. So we're going to look at representation, the perception guidelines and language symbols. So we go in there, it's just kind of a simple thing. They watch this video. Maybe some of you have seen this online too about representation. So there's a good introduction for it. And then read through CAST's principles of representation. And each one of these clicks and links to the CAST site for each one of these uh, uh, guidelines, right? And then the exercise for the week, there's some options of what they can do. Create a sort of analysis, come up with who the audience is, what barriers are in that document for it. And then, you know, you can share your thoughts as text, video, or audio. It's nice with UDL, so they're practicing on that one, too. And then they're thinking about uh, ways that they could respond to their classmates and what they're saying. Okay. And then in week three, they take the actual assignment that they looked at before, and now they revise it. So in this one, they'll have all kinds of examples with those uh, areas coming in there, too. So if we rise for representation. And in weeks four with uh, same things, but this time action and expression. We do guidelines four and five, physical action and expression and communication. Uh, they pick an assessment coming in there within two. And then uh, week five, there is the uh, review where they're putting that one in there too. Engagement, seven, same type of thing as we're going through. And again, if, don't, if scrolling is difficult, please look away to move through. And we get to the cultural variability. There's some good, good references here. 
Rose's Cracks in the Foundation, Liberatory Design, uh, Degner's article, Culturally Responsive Teaching, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Online Learning, uh, Ways to Mitigate Implicit Bias. We talk about unconscious bias and how that might affect your design strategies too. And there's some kind of tests in there from Brown and Harvard, which are fun for the students because they're amazed that these things even exist. And they, they kind of take them, of course, with a grain of salt, but interesting to know that they're kind of away, uh, aware of those two. Okay, then we move into the accessibility portion of the course, web accessibility, accessible word documents. Over here, it's called Digitale Barrier Freiheit, right? So it's kind of interesting to see the translation of the different words coming in. Talk about VPATs, talk about Cobliss and the color blindness simulators, examples of color blindness, web aim, color contrast checkers, right? And we're still, we're continuing with our UDL theory and practice, right? Keeping that going. And there's some activities and discussions and things like review a website with WAVE, totally, or AI inspective, so that they become aware that there's accessibility checkers you know, are out there. Okay, inclusive content and courses, module nine, so that gets into, okay, where does universal design and accessibility? They're not the same things at all. And so we wanna make sure that they understand that they're kind of two realms of that at least, but that usability, accessibility, inclusivity is all part of that universal design. And a UDL curriculum, right? Goals, materials, teaching approaches, and assessment. We cover those. Uh, chapter six is all about the curriculum and UDL tools. It's a lot of what we get into with the strategic reader in here. And then uh, accessible video and audio and uh, course content and accessibility checkers in there. Uh, and the final thing, of course, is the course review and farewells. Okay, final papers in there. And lots of you know course materials and supplementary resources. Moodle makes it easy just to link directly to those kinds of places. You know, the German frame, there's a German translation to the framework. So put that in there. How to improve accessibility. We teachers, social and emotional learning, because so much of UDL is related to SEL and PBL and accessibility in online courses. And there's a place for them to submit their assignments in here. Okay, talked about some of our student projects. This was one, they took the German translation of the framework, right, from Wella and Member and Sonder Peregrine, that's from 2016 from the CAST website that's in there too. And then put together a WordPress site where they, or Sway, sorry, Sway and Microsoft, where they went through each of the checkpoints and expanded with specific kinds of examples of what a teacher might be able to do. So while the translation was already there, this kind of represents a neat website that anybody looking for more information could find more about those specific points and then find how that's going in. So lots of good work in that and then trying to put it into German language for teachers to use, right? This last one, just to show you from the EU and the e-twinning world, here's the UDL group uh, that I run for, for this thing. And the whole idea is to promote UDL projects with teachers at the primary school level, middle school, and also the the, the higher levels too. So you want to try to keep all those things uh, going and then in there. As we finish up the presentation, just wanted to mention, you know, wish we had, like, had some more time, we'd talk to you about the evaluation of it more in depth. I've taught this course now three times. Uh, we've had about 92 teachers, pre-service teachers go through it across those five colleges. You know, they've produced 36 videos, 45 research papers, three master's theses, and then three theses, these theses, sorry, and three European Union e twinning projects from all of that too. And just as a quick summary of what the course evaluations have shown, besides enjoying the course, you know, it's it's not a grade heavy course. A lot of the courses over here in Germany are letter grade. You turn in a paper, take a test. So this one, just taking the pressure off and off of the grades is kind of popular. So it gets high marks about student satisfaction. And I don't think that has a lot to do with me or the course. It's just the environment and the course materials are just so interesting. And, you know, I, I do that standard question at the beginning, you know, rate your interest at UDL when you started the course, where is it now? And, you know, that, that's almost, you hope that it's going to go up. And of course, this is the average of one to five, one is low, five is high. So the, the average so far, and I cumulative these uh, uh, surveys, right? So put them together rather than doing in separate ways. So that went from two six to four seven. Um, how many? Maybe it's a freebie. How many of you will use UDL when designing lessons? It's almost an easy question to get high scores on because 
A lot of us, we already use UDL without knowing that it's UDL, right? Um, this question is how many felt that UDL should be required as part of their teacher training, at least learning about it. And, you know, that was 4.8. Um, after taking this course, how do you feel about motivating to become a teacher? And some of them said, you know, if you're more, that they're more, that they're up at, agree with the statement that they're at 4.5. And I, I think that's in particular because here in Germany, a lot of the students are taking this class before they've done their teacher training in the schools. So it's so heavy academic that they haven't really tried teaching yet, unless they're tutoring on their own or working with, you know, kids someplace else. Really hard to know that I've done all the study, I've done the study, am I going to really like teaching? I, we wait in Germany a very long time before students have their chance to get into the schools and then teach. So I think class like this, that, that takes all the pressure out being a sage on stage and knowing everything as a teacher really helps them to say, hey, I can adjust. I can use options. I, not one size is going to work. Everything it takes a lot of the pressure when you start learning about UDL, about the expert learner, expert teacher, and expert curriculum really interesting to, to have that pressure off a future teacher's shoulders to come in there to do. And that's where this other one is coming into. They're less anxious about teaching than it was for a 0.5 um, where it hits. So that concludes my async presentation. My name was Richard Powers. This is UDL and student teachers in Germany at Success Story. And I hope you get in touch with me if you're interested or uh, you'd like to work on a project together, maybe with your students in the States or wherever you are, Canada, wherever you are, you know, maybe listening to this, if you'd like to work with some German Lehramt students in English, right, or German either, get in touch with me. Uh, there's my uh, email address. And there's some more information about me here too. Um, my courses, I think because of the pandemic, I'd already been an online teacher before the pandemic. And then I won the Teaching Excellence Award at Stuttgart University uh, in 2021. And I think the UDL, the PBL with eTwinning, and then the instructional design courses were reasons for that, uh, you know, that they were just so different for teachers and training. And it was a good time for online teaching to uh, raise its head in there. But stalling a little bit. So in case you're interested in the email address, you're writing it down. Or the website, you know, the slides are probably available too through the CAST Summit and uh, or the UDL Summit. And there's my Twitter. It's rpowers100. If you want to do that, you can catch me on uh, LinkedIn too. So I'm going to stop sharing, bring me back here, and wish everybody a wonderful 2023 UDL IRN Summit. And if you see me around uh, the 14th or 16th in, in Orlando, please say hello. Right. So I look forward to seeing everybody. Hey, okay, bye bye.